This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, and for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Kristen Luoma at GreenKRI.com. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 22 The Smugglers. Dantes had not been a day on board before he had a very clear idea of the men with whom his lot had been cast. Without having been in the school of the Abbe Faria, the worthy master of the young Amelia, the name of the Genoese Tartan, knew a smattering of all the tongues spoken on the shores of that large lake called the Mediterranean, from the Arabic to the Provençal, and this, while it spared him interpreters, persons always troublesome and frequently indiscreet, gave him great facilities of communication, either with the vessels he met at sea, with the small boats sailing along the coast, or with the people without name, country, or occupation, who are always seen on the quays of the seaports, and who live by hidden and mysterious means, which we must suppose to be the direct gift of providence, as they have no visible means of support. It is fair to assume that Dantes was on board a smuggler. At first the captain had received Dantes on board with a certain degree of distrust. He was very well known to the customs officers of the coast, and as there was between these worthies and himself a perpetual battle of wits, he had at first thought that Dantes might be an emissary of these industrious guardians of rights and duties, who perhaps employed this ingenious means of learning some of the secrets of his trade. But the skilful manner in which Dantes had handled the luger had entirely reassured him, and then, when he saw the light plume of the smoke floating above the bastion of the Chateau d'If, and heard the distant report, he was instantly struck with the idea that he had on board his vessel one whose coming and going, like that of kings, was accompanied with salutes of artillery. This made him less uneasy, it must be owned, than if the newcomer had proved to be a customs officer. But this supposition also disappeared like the first, when he beheld the perfect tranquillity of his recruit. Edmund thus had the advantage of knowing what the owner was, without the owner knowing who he was, and however the old sailor and his crew tried to pump him, they extracted nothing more from him. He gave accurate descriptions of Naples and Malta, which he knew as well as Marseilles, and held stoutly to his first story. Thus the Genoese, subtle as he was, was duped by Edmund, in whose favour his mild demeanour, his nautical skill, and his admirable dissimulation pleaded. Moreover, it is possible that the Genoese was one of those shrewd persons who know nothing but what they should know, and believe nothing but what they should believe. In this state of mutual understanding they reached Leghorn. Here Edmund was to undergo another trial. He was to find out whether he could recognize himself, as he had not seen his own face for fourteen years. He had preserved a tolerably good remembrance of what the youth had been, and was now to find out what the man had become. His comrades believed that his vow was fulfilled. As he had twenty times touched at Leghorn, he remembered a barber in St. Ferdinand Street. He went there to have his beard and hair cut. The barber gazed in amazement at this man with the long, thick, and black hair and beard, which gave his head the appearance of one of Titian's portraits. At this period it was not the fashion to wear so large a beard and hair so long. Now a barber would only be surprised if a man gifted with such advantages should consent voluntarily to deprive himself of them. The leghorn barber said nothing and went to work. When the operation was concluded, and Edmund felt that his chin was completely smooth and his hair reduced to its usual length, he asked for a hand-glass. He was now, as we have said, three and thirty years of age, and his fourteen years' imprisonment had produced a great transformation in his appearance. Dantes had entered the Chateau d'If with the round, open, smiling face of a young and happy man, with whom the early paths of life have been smooth, and who anticipates a future corresponding with his past. This was now all changed. The oval face was lengthened. His smiling mouth had assumed the firm and marked lines which betoken resolution. His eyebrows were arched beneath a brow furrowed with thought. 
His eyes were full of melancholy, and from their depths occasionally sparkled gloomy fires of misanthropy and hatred. His complexion, so long kept from the sun, had now that pale color which produces, when the features are encircled with black hair, the aristocratic beauty of the man of the North. The profound learning he had acquired had besides diffused over his features a refined intellectual expression. And he had also acquired, being naturally of a goodly stature, that vigor which a frame possesses which has so long concentrated all its force within itself. To the elegance of a nervous and slight form had succeeded the solidity of a rounded and muscular figure. As to his voice, prayers, sobs, and imprecations had changed it so that at times it was of a singularly penetrating sweetness, and at others rough and almost hoarse. Moreover, from being so long in twilight or darkness, his eyes had acquired the faculty of distinguishing objects in the night, common to the hyena and the wolf. Edmund smiled when he beheld himself. It was impossible that his best friend, if indeed he had any friends left, could recognize him. He could not recognize himself. The master of the young Amelia, who was very desirous of retaining amongst his crew a man of Edmund's value, had offered to advance him funds out of his future profits, which Edmund has accepted. His next care on leaving the barbers, who had achieved his first metamorphosis, was to enter a shop and buy a complete sailor's suit, a garb, as we all know, very simple and consisting of white trousers, a striped shirt, and a cap. It was in this costume, and bringing back to Jacopo the shirt and trousers he had lent him, that Edmund reappeared before the captain of the lugger, who had made him tell his story over and over again before he could believe him, or recognize in the neat and trim sailor the man with thick and matted beard, hair tangled with seaweed, and body soaking in sea brine, whom he had picked up naked and nearly drowned. Attracted by his prepossessing appearance, he renewed his offers of an engagement to Dantes. But Dantes, who had his own projects, would not agree for a longer time than three months. The young Amelia had a very active crew, very obedient to their captain, who lost as little time as possible. He had scarcely been a week at Leghorn before the hold of his vessel was filled with printed muslins, contraband cottons, English powder, and tobacco on which the excise had forgotten to put its mark. The master was to get all this out of Leghorn free of duties, and land it on the shores of Corsica where certain speculators undertook to forward the cargo to France. They sailed. Edmund was again cleaving the azure sea which had been the first horizon of his youth, and which he had so often dreamed of in prison. He left Gorgon on his right, and La Pionassa on his left, and went towards the country of Paoli and Napoleon. The next morning going on deck, as he always did at an early hour, the patron found Dantes leaning against the bulwarks, gazing with intense earnestness at a pile of granite rocks which the rising sun tinged with rosy light. It was the island of Monte Cristo. The young Amelia left it three-quarters of a league to the larboard, and kept on for Corsica. Dantes thought, as they passed so closely to the island, whose name was so interesting to him, that he had only to leap into the sea, and in half an hour be at the promised land. But then what could he do without instruments to discover his treasure, without arms to defend himself? Besides, what would the sailors say? What would the patron think? He must wait. Fortunately, Dantes had learned how to wait. He had waited fourteen years for his liberty, and now he was free, he could wait at least six months or a year for wealth. Would he not have accepted liberty without riches if it had been offered to him? Besides, were not those riches chimerical? Offspring of the brain of the poor Abbe Faria, had they not died with him? It is true, the letter of the Cardinal Spada was singularly circumstantial, and Dantes repeated it to himself, from one end to the other, for he had not forgotten a word. Evening came, and Edmund saw the island tinged with the shades of twilight, and then disappear in the darkness from all eyes but his own, for he, with vision accustomed to the gloom of a prison, continued to behold it last of all for he remained alone upon deck. 
The next morn broke off the coast of Valeria. All day they coasted, and in the evening saw fires lighted on land. The position of these was no doubt a signal for landing, for a ship's lantern was hung up at the masthead instead of the streamer, and they came to within a gunshot of the shore. Dantes noticed that the captain of the young Amelia had, as he neared the land, mounted two small culverins, which, without making much noise, can throw a four-ounce ball a thousand paces or so. But on this occasion the precaution was superfluous, and everything proceeded with the utmost smoothness and politeness. Four shallops came off with very little noise alongside the lugger, which, no doubt, in acknowledgment of the compliment, lowered her own shallop into the sea, and the five boats worked so well that by two o'clock in the morning all the cargo was out of the young Amelia and on terra firma. The same night such a man of regularity was the patron of the young Amelia. The profits were divided, and each man had a hundred Tuscan livres, or about eighty francs. But the voyage was not ended. They turned the bowsprit towards Sardinia, where they intended to take in a cargo, which was to replace what had been discharged. The second operation was as successful as the first. The young Amelia was in luck. This new cargo was destined for the coast of the Duchy of Lucca, and consisted almost entirely of Havana cigars, sherry, and Malaga wines. There they had a bit of a skirmish in getting rid of the duties. The excise was, in truth, the everlasting enemy of the patron of the young Amelia. A customs officer was laid low, and two sailors wounded. Dantes was one of the latter, a ball having touched him in the left shoulder. Dantes was almost glad of this affray, and almost pleased at being wounded, for they were rude lessons which taught him with what eye he could view danger, and with what endurance he could bear suffering. He had contemplated danger with a smile, and when wounded had exclaimed with the great philosopher, Pain, thou art not an evil. He had, moreover, looked upon the customs officer wounded to death, and whether from heat of blood produced by the encounter, or chill of human sentiment, the sight had made but slight impression upon him. Dantes was on the way he desired to follow, and was moving towards the end he wished to achieve. His heart was in a fair way of petrifying in his bosom. Jacopo, seeing him fall, had believed him killed, and rushing towards him raised him up, and then attended to him with all the kindness of a devoted comrade. This world was not then so good as Dr. Pangloss believed it, neither was it so wicked as Dantes thought it, since this man, who had nothing to expect from his comrade but the inheritance of his share of the prize-money, manifested so much sorrow when he saw him fall. Fortunately, as we have said, Edmund was only wounded, and with certain herbs gathered at certain seasons, and sold to the smugglers by the old Sardinian women, the wound soon closed. Edmund then resolved to try Jacopo, and offered him in return for his attention a share of his prize-money, but Jacopo refused it indignantly. As a result of the sympathetic devotion which Jacopo had from the first bestowed on Edmund, the latter was moved to a certain degree of affection. But this sufficed for Jacopo, who instinctively felt that Edmund had a right to superiority of position, a superiority which Edmund had concealed from all others, and from this time the kindness which Edmund showed him was enough for the brave seaman. Then in the long days on board ship when the vessel, gliding on with security over the azure sea, required no care but the hand of the helmsman, thanks to the favorable winds that swelled her sails, Edmund, with a chart in his hand, became the instructor of Jacopo, as the poor Abbe Faria had been his tutor. He pointed out to him the bearings of the coast, explained to him the variations of the compass, and taught him to read in that vast book, opened over our heads which they call heaven, and where God writes in azure with letters of diamonds. And when Jacopo inquired of him, What is the use of teaching all these things to a poor sailor like me? Edmund replied, who knows? You may one day be the captain of a vessel. Your fellow countryman, Bonaparte, became emperor. We had forgotten to say that Jacopo was a Corsican. Two months and a half elapsed in these trips, and Edmund had become as skilful a coaster 
as he had been a hardy seaman. He had formed an acquaintance with all the smugglers on the coast, and learned all the Masonic signs by which these half-pirates recognize each other. He had passed and repassed his island of Monte Cristo twenty times, but not once had he found an opportunity of landing there. He then formed a resolution. As soon as his engagement with the patron of the young Amelia ended, he would hire a small vessel on his own account, for in his several voyages he had amassed a hundred piastres, and under some pretext land at the island of Monte Cristo. Then he would be free to make his researches, not perhaps entirely at liberty, for he would be doubtless watched by those who accompanied him. But in this world we must risk something. Prison had made Edmund prudent, and he was desirous of running no risk whatever. But in vain did he rack his imagination, fertile as it was, he could not devise any plan for reaching the island without companionship. Dantes was tossed about on these doubts and wishes, when the patron, who had great confidence in him, and was very desirous of retaining him in his service, took him by the arm one evening and led him to a tavern on the Via del Oglio, where the leading smugglers of Leghorn used to congregate and discuss affairs connected with their trade. Already Dantes had visited this maritime bourse two or three times, and seeing all these hardy free traders, who supplied the whole coast for nearly two hundred leagues in extent, he had asked himself what power might not that man attain who should give the impulse of his will to all these contrary and diverging minds. This time was a great matter that was under discussion, connected with a vessel laden with turkey carpets, stuffs of the Levant and cashmeres. It was necessary to find some neutral ground on which an exchange could be made, and then to try and land these goods on the coast of France. If the venture was successful, the profit would be enormous. There would be a gain of fifty or sixty piastres, each for the crew. The patron of the young Amelia proposed as a place of landing the island of Monte Cristo, which being completely deserted, and having neither soldiers nor revenue officers, seemed to have been placed in the midst of the ocean since the time of the heathen Olympus by Mercury, the god of merchants and robbers, classes of mankind which we in modern times have separated if not made distinct, but which antiquity appears to have included in the same category. At the mention of Monte Cristo, Dantes started with joy. He rose to conceal his emotion, and took a turn around the smoky tavern, where all the languages of the known world were jumbled in a lingua franca. When he again joined the two persons who had been discussing the matter, it had been decided that they should touch at Monte Cristo, and set out on the following night. Edmund, being consulted, was of opinion that the island afforded every possible security, and that great enterprises to be well done should be done quickly. Nothing, then, was altered in the plan, and orders were given to get under way next night, and, wind and weather permitting, to make the neutral island by the following day. End of chapter 22 The Count of Monte Cristo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 23 The Island of Monte Cristo. Thus, at length, by one of the unexpected strokes of fortune which sometimes befall those who have for a long time been the victims of an evil destiny, Dantes was about to secure the opportunity he wished for, by simple and natural means, to land on the island without incurring any suspicion. One night more, and he would be on his way. The night was one of feverish distraction, and in its progress visions good and evil passed through Dante's mind. If he closed his eyes he saw Cardinal Spada's letter, written on the wall in characters of flame. If he slept for a moment, the wildest dreams haunted his brain. He ascended into grottoes paved with emeralds, with panels of rubies, and the roof glowing with diamond stalactites. Pearls fell drop by drop, as subterranean waters filter in their caves. 
Edmund, amazed, wonderstruck, filled his pockets with the radiant gems, and then returned to daylight, when he discovered that his prizes had all changed into common pebbles. He then endeavoured to re-enter the marvellous grottoes, but they had suddenly receded, and now the path became a labyrinth, and then the entrance vanished, and in vain did he tax his memory for the magic and mysterious word which opened the splendid caverns of Ali Baba to the Arabian fishermen. All was useless. The treasure disappeared, and had again reverted to the genie from whom for a moment he had hoped to carry it off. The day came at length, and was almost as feverish as the night had been, but it brought reason to the aid of imagination, and Dantes was then enabled to arrange a plan which had hitherto been vague and unsettled in his brain. Night came, and with it the preparations for departure, and these preparations served to conceal Dantes' agitation. He had by degrees assumed such authority over his companions that he was almost like a commander on board, and as his orders were always clear, distinct, and easy of execution, his comrades obeyed him with celerity and pleasure. The old patron did not interfere, for he too had recognized the superiority of Dantes over the crew and himself. He saw in the young man his natural successor and regretted that he had not a daughter, since he might have bound Edmund to him by a more secure alliance. At seven o'clock in the evening all was ready, and at ten minutes past seven they doubled the lighthouse just as the beacon was kindled. The sea was calm, and with a fresh breeze from the south-east they sailed beneath a bright blue sky, in which God also lighted up in turn his beacon lights, each of which is a world. Dantes told them that all hands might turn in, and he would take the helm. When the Maltese, for so they called Dantes, had said this, it was sufficient, and all went to their bunks contentedly. This frequently happened. Dantes, cast from solitude into the world, frequently experienced an imperious desire for solitude, and what solitude is more complete or more poetical? than that of a ship floating in isolation on the sea during the obscurity of the night, in the silence of immensity, and under the eye of heaven. Now this solitude was peopled with his thoughts, the night lighted up by his illusions, and the silence animated by his anticipations. When the patron awoke, the vessel was hurrying on with every sail set and every sail full with the breeze. They were making nearly ten knots an hour. The island of Monte Cristo loomed large in the horizon. Edmund resigned the lugger to the master's care, and went and lay down in his hammock, but in spite of a sleepless night he could not close his eyes for a moment. Two hours afterward he came on deck, as the boat was about to double the island of Elba. They were just abreast of Marikiana, and beyond the flat but verdant isle of La Pianosa. The peak of Monte Cristo, reddened by the burning sun, was seen against the azure sky. Dantes ordered the helmsman to put down his helm, in order to leave La Pianosa to starboard, as he knew that he should shorten his course by two or three knots. After five o'clock in the evening the island was distinct, and everything on it was plainly perceptible, owing to that clearness of the atmosphere peculiar to the light which the rays of the sun cast at its setting. Edmund gazed very earnestly at the mass of rocks which gave out all the variety of twilight colours, from the brightest pink to the deepest blue, and from time to time his cheeks flushed, his brow darkened, and a mist passed over his eyes. Never did gamester, whose whole fortune is staked on one cast of the die, experience the anguish which Edmund felt in his, his paroxysms of hope. Night came and at ten o'clock they anchored. The young Amelia was first at the rendezvous. In spite of his usual command over himself, Dantes could not restrain his impetuosity. He was the first to jump on shore, and, had he dared, he would, like Lucius Brutus, have kissed his mother earth. It was dark, but at eleven o'clock the moon rose in the midst of the ocean, whose every wave she silvered, and then, ascending high, 
played in floods of pale light on the rocky hills of this second Pelion. The island was familiar to the crew of the young Amelia. It was one of her regular haunts. As to Dantes, he had passed it on his voyage to and from the Levant, but never touched at it. He questioned Jacopo. "'Where shall we pass the night?' he inquired. "'Why, on board the Tartan,' replied the sailor. "'Should we not do better in the grottoes?' "'What grottoes?' "'Why, the grottoes, caves of the island.' "'I do not know of any grottoes,' replied Jacopo. The cold sweat sprang forth on Dante's brow. "'What? Are there no grottoes at Monte Cristo?' he asked. "'None.' For a moment Dantes was speechless. Then he remembered that these caves might have been filled up by some accident, or even stopped up for the sake of greater security by Cardinal Spada. The point was, then, to discover the hidden entrance. It was useless to search at night, and Dantes therefore delayed all investigation until the morning. Besides, a signal made half a league out at sea, and to which the young Amelia replied by a similar signal, indicated that the moment for business had come. The boat that now arrived, assured by the answering signal that all was well, soon came in sight, white and silent as a phantom, and cast anchor within a cable's length of shore. Then the landing began. Dantes reflected as he worked on the shout of joy which, with a single word, he could evoke from all these men, if he gave utterance to the one unchanging thought that pervaded his heart. But. Far from disclosing this precious secret, he almost feared that he had already said too much, and by his restlessness and continual questions, his minute observations and evident preoccupation, aroused suspicions. Fortunately, as regarded this circumstance at least, his painful past gave to his countenance an indelible sadness, and the glimmerings of gaiety seen beneath this cloud were indeed but transitory. No one had the slightest suspicion, and when next day, taking a fowling-piece, powder, and shot, Dantes declared his intention to go and kill some of the wild goats that were seen springing from rock to rock, his wish was construed into a love of sport, or a desire for solitude. However, Jacopo insisted on following him, and Dantes did not oppose this, feeling, if he did so, that he might incur distrust. Scarcely, however, had they gone a quarter of a league, when, having killed a kid, he begged Jacopo to take it to his comrades, and request them to cook it, and when ready to let him know by firing a gun. This, and some dried fruits, and a flask of Montepulciano, was the bill of fare. Dantes went on, looking from time to time behind and around about him. Having reached the summit of a rock, he saw, a thousand feet beneath him, his companions, whom Jacopo had rejoined, and who were all busy preparing the repast which Edmund's skill as a marksman had augmented with a capital dish. Edmund looked at them for a moment with the sad and gentle smile of a man superior to his fellows. "'In two hours' time,' said he, "'these persons will depart richer by fifty piastres each, to go and risk their lives again by endeavouring to gain fifty more.' then they will return with a fortune of six hundred francs, and waste this treasure in some city with the pride of sultans and the insolence of nabobs. At this moment hope makes me despise their riches, which seem to me contemptible. Yet perchance to-morrow deception will so act on me that I shall, on compulsion, consider such a contemptible possession as the utmost happiness. Oh, no! exclaimed Edmund, that will not be. The wise, unerring Faria could not be mistaken in this one thing. Besides, it were better to die than to continue to lead this low and wretched life. Thus Dantes, who but three months before had no desire but liberty, had now not liberty enough, and panted for wealth. This cause was not in Dantes, but in Providence, who, while limiting the power of man, has filled him with boundless desires. Meanwhile, by a cleft between two walls of rock, following a path worn by a torrent, and which in all human probability human foot had never before trod, Dantes approached the spot where he supposed the grottoes must have existed. 
Keeping along the shore, and examining the smallest object with serious attention, he thought he could trace, on certain rocks, marks made by the hand of man. Time, which encrusts all physical substances with its mossy mantle, as it invests all things of the mind with forgetfulness, seemed to have respected these signs, which apparently had been made with some degree of regularity, and probably with a definite purpose. Occasionally the marks were hidden under tufts of myrtle, which spread into large bushes laden with blossoms, or beneath parasitical lichen. So Edmund had to separate the branches, or brush away the moss, to know where the guide-marks were. The sight of marks renewed Edmund's fondest hopes. Might it not have been the cardinal himself who had first traced them, in order that they might serve as a guide for his nephew in the event of a catastrophe which he could not foresee, would have been so complete? This solitary place was precisely suited to the requirements of a man desirous of burying treasure. Only, might not those betraying marks have attracted other eyes than those for whom they were made? and had the dark and wondrous island indeed faithfully guarded its precious secret. It seemed, however, to Edmund, who was hidden from his comrades by the inequalities of the ground, that at sixty paces from the harbour the marks ceased, nor did they terminate at any grotto. A large round rock, placed solidly on its base, was the only spot to which they seemed to lead. Edmund concluded that perhaps, instead of having reached the end of the route, he had only explored its beginning and he therefore turned round and retraced his steps. Meanwhile his comrades had prepared the repast, had got some water from a spring, spread out the fruit and bread, and cooked the kid. Just at the moment when they were taking the dainty animal from the spit, they saw Edmund springing with the boldness of a chamois from rock to rock, and they fired the signal agreed upon. The sportsman instantly changed his direction and ran quickly towards them. But even while they watched his daring progress, Edmund's foot slipped, and they saw him stagger on the edge of a rock, and disappear. They all rushed towards him, for all loved Edmund in spite of his superiority, yet Jacopo reached him first. He found Edmund lying prone, bleeding, and almost senseless. He had rolled down a declivity of twelve or fifteen feet. They poured a little rum down his throat, and this remedy, which had before been so beneficial to him, produced the same effect as formerly. Edmund opened his eyes, complained of a great pain in his knee, a feeling of heaviness in his head, and severe pains in his loins. They wished to carry him to the shore, but when they touched him, although under Jacopo's directions, he declared with heavy groans that he could not bear to be moved. It may be supposed that Dantes did not now think of his dinner, but he insisted that his comrades, who had not his reasons for fasting, should have their meal. As for himself, he declared that he had only need of a little rest, and that when they returned he should be easier. The sailors did not require much urging. They were hungry, and the smell of the roasted kid was very savoury, and your tars are not very ceremonious. An hour afterwards they returned. All that Edmund had been able to do was to drag himself about a dozen paces forward, to lean against a moss-grown rock. But, instead of growing easier, Dante's pains appeared to increase in violence. The old patron who was obliged to sail in the morning in order to land his cargo on the frontiers of Piedmont and France, between Nice and Freu, urged Dante to try and rise. Edmund made great exertions in order to comply, but at each effort he fell back, moaning and turning pale. "'He has broken his ribs,' said the commander, in a low voice. "'No matter, he is an excellent fellow, and we must not leave him. We will try and carry him on board the Tartan.' Dantes declared, however, that he would rather die where he was than undergo the agony which the slightest movement cost him. "'Well,' said the patron, "'let what may happen. It shall never be said that we deserted a good comrade like you. We will not go till evening.' This very much astonished the sailors, although not one opposed it. The patron was so strict that this was the first time they had ever seen him give up an enterprise or even delay in its execution. Dantes would not allow that any such infraction of regular and proper rules should be made in his favour. "'No, no,' he said to the patron, "'I was awkward, and it is just that I pay the penalty of my clumsiness. Leave me a small supply of biscuit, a gun, powder, 
and balls to kill the kids or defend myself at need, and a pickaxe that I may build a shelter if you delay in coming back for me. "'But you'll die of hunger,' said the patron. "'I would rather do so,' was Edmund's reply, "'than suffer the inexpressible agonies which the slightest movement causes me.' The patron turned towards his vessel, which was rolling on the swell in the little harbour, and, with sails partly set, would be ready for sea when her toilet should be completed. "'What are we to do, Maltese?' asked the captain. "'We cannot leave you here so, and yet we cannot stay.' "'Go, go!' exclaimed Dantes. "'We shall be absent at least a week,' said the patron, "'and then we must run out of our course to come here and take you up again.' "'Why,' said Dantes, "'if in two or three days you hail any fishing-boat, desire them to come here to me. I will pay twenty-five piastres for my passage back to Leghorn. If you do not come across one, return for me.' The patron shook his head. "'Listen, Captain Baldy,' "'There's one way of settling this,' said Jacopo. "'Do you go, and I will stay and take care of the wounded man.' "'And give up your share of the venture,' said Edmund, "'to remain with me?' "'Yes,' said Jacopo, "'and without any hesitation. "'You are a good fellow, and a kind-hearted messmate,' replied Edmund. "'And heaven will recompense you for your generous intentions, "'but I do not wish any one to stay with me. "'A day or two of rest will set me up, "'and I hope I shall find among the rocks "'certain herbs most excellent for bruises.' "'A peculiar smile passed over Dante's lips. "'He squeezed Jacopo's hand warmly, "'but nothing could shake his determination to remain, "'and remain alone. "'The smugglers left with Edmund what he had requested "'and set sail.' but not without turning around several times, and each time making signs of a cordial farewell, to which Edmund replied with his hand only, as if he could not move the rest of his body. Then, when they had disappeared, he said with a smile, "'It is strange that it should be among such men that we find proofs of friendship and devotion.' Then he dragged himself cautiously to the top of a rock, from which he had a full view of the sea, and thence he saw the Tartan complete her preparations for sailing weigh anchor, and, balancing herself as gracefully as a waterfowl, ere it takes to the wing, set sail. At the end of an hour she was completely out of sight. At least it was impossible for the wounded man to see her any longer from the spot where he was. Then Dante's rose, more agile and light than the kid among the myrtles and shrubs of these wild rocks, took his gun in one hand, his pickaxe in the other, and hastened towards the rock on which the marks he had noted terminated. "'And now,' he exclaimed, remembering the tale of the Arabian fisherman, which Farrier had related to him, "'now open sesame!' End of chapter 23「The leaves of the myrtle and olive trees waved and rustled in the wind. At every step that Edmond took he disturbed the lizards glittering with the hues of the emerald. Afar off he saw the wild goats bounding from crag to crag. In a word, the island was inhabited, yet Edmond felt himself alone, guided by the hand of God. He felt an indescribable sensation somewhat akin to dread, that dread of the daylight which even in the desert makes us fear we are watched and observed. This feeling was so strong that at the moment when Edmond was about to begin his labor, he stopped, laid down his pickaxe, seized his gun, mounted to the summit of the highest rock, and from thence gazed round in every direction. But it was not upon Corsica, the very houses of which he could distinguish, or on Sardinia, or on the island of Elba with its historical associations, or upon the almost imperceptible line that to the experienced eye of a sailor alone revealed the coast of Genoa the Proud and Leghorn the commercial that he gazed. It was at the brigantine that had left in the morning, and the tartan that had just set sail, that Edmond fixed his eyes. The first was just disappearing in the straits of Bonifacio, the other, following in opposite direction, 
was about to round the island of Corsica. This sight reassured him. He then looked at the objects near him. He saw that he was on the highest point of the island, a statue on this vast pedestal of granite, nothing human appearing in sight, while the blue ocean beat against the base of the island and covered it with a fringe of foam. Then he descended with cautious and slow step, for he dreaded lest an accident similar to that he had so adroitly feigned should happen in reality. Dantes, as we have said, had traced the marks along the rocks, and he had noticed that they led to a small creek, which was hidden like the bath of some ancient nymph. This creek was sufficiently wide at its mouth, and deep in the center, to admit of the entrance of a small vessel of the lugger class, which would be perfectly concealed from observation. Then following the clue that, in the hands of the Abbey Faria, had been so skillfully used to guide him through the Didalian labyrinth of probabilities, he thought that the Cardinal Spada, anxious not to be watched, had entered the creek, concealed his little bark, followed the line marked by the notches in the rock, and at the end of it had buried his treasure. It was this idea that had brought Dantes back to the circular rock. One thing only perplexed Edmond and destroyed his theory. How could this rock, which weighed several tons, have been lifted to the spot without the aid of many men? Suddenly an idea flashed across his mind. Instead of raising it, thought he, they have lowered it, and he sprang from the rock in order to inspect the base on which it had formerly stood. He soon perceived that a slope had been formed, and the rock had slid along this until it stopped at the spot it now occupied. A large stone had served as a wedge, flints and pebbles had been inserted around it so as to conceal the orifice. This species of masonry had been covered with earth, and grass and weeds had grown there. Moss had clung to these stones, myrtle bushes had taken root, and the old rock seemed fixed to the earth. Dantes dug away the earth carefully, and detected, or fancied he detected, the ingenious artifice. He attacked this wall, cemented by the hand of time, with his pickaxe. After ten minutes' labor, the wall gave way, and a hole large enough to insert the arm was opened. Dantes went and cut the strongest olive tree he could find, stripped off his branches, inserted it in the hole, and used it as a lever. But the rock was too heavy, and too firmly wedged to be moved by any one man, were he Hercules himself. Dantes saw that he must attack the wedge, but how? He cast his eyes around, and saw the horn full of powder which his friend Jacopo had left him. He smiled. This infernal invention would serve him for this purpose. With the aid of his pickaxe, Dantes, after the manner of a labor-saving pioneer, dug a mine between the upper rock and the one that supported it, filled it with powder, and then made a match by rolling his handkerchief in saltpeter. He lighted it and retired. The explosion soon followed. The upper rock was lifted from its base by the terrific force of the powder. The lower one flew into pieces. Thousands of insects escaped from the aperture Dantes had previously formed, and a huge snake, like the guardian demon of the treasure, rolled himself along in darkening coils and disappeared. Dantes approached the upper rock, which now, without any support, leaned towards the sea. The intrepid treasure-seeker walked round it and, selecting the spot from whence it appeared most susceptible to attack, placed his lever in one of the crevices and strained every nerve to move the mass. The rock, already shaken by the explosion, tottered on its base. Dantes redoubled his efforts. He seemed like one of the ancient titans who uprooted the mountains to hurl against the father of the gods. The rock yielded, rolled over, bounded from point to point, and finally disappeared in the ocean. On the spot it had occupied was a circular space, exposing an iron ring let into a square flagstone. Dantes uttered a cry of joy and surprise. Never had a first attempt been crowned with more perfect success. He would fain have continued, but his knees trembled, and his heart beat so violently, and his sight became so dim that he was forced to pause. This feeling lasted but for a moment. Edmond inserted his lever in the ring and exerted all his strength. The flagstone yielded and disclosed steps that descended until they were lost in the obscurity of a subterraneous grotto. Anyone else would have rushed on with a cry of joy. Dantes turned pale, hesitated and reflected. Come, said he to himself, be a man. I am accustomed to adversity. I must not be cast down by the discovery that I have been deceived. What, then, would be the use of all I have suffered? The heart breaks when, after having been elated by flattering hopes, it sees all its illusions destroyed. Faria has dreamed this. The Cardinal Spada buried no treasure here. Perhaps he never came here, or if he did, Caesar Borgia 
the intrepid adventurer, the stealthy and indefatigable plunderer, has followed him, discovered his traces, pursued them as I have done, raised the stone, and descending before me, has left me nothing. He remained motionless and pensive, his eyes fixed on the gloomy aperture that was open at his feet. Now that I expect nothing, now that I no longer entertain the slightest hopes, the end of this adventure becomes simply a matter of curiosity. And he remained again motionless and thoughtful. Yes, yes, this is an adventure worthy of place in the varied career of that royal bandit. This fabulous event formed but a link in a long chain of marvels. Yes, Borgia has been here, a torch in one hand, a sword in the other. And within twenty paces at the foot of this rock, perhaps two guards kept watch on land and sea, while their master descended, as I am about to descend, dispelling the darkness before his awe-inspiring progress. But what was the fate of the guards who thus possessed his secret, asked Don Tezip himself. The fate, replied he, smiling, of those who buried Alaric. Yet had he come, thought Dantes, he would have found the treasure, and Borgia, he who compared Italy to an artichoke, which he could devour leaf by leaf, knew too well the value of time to waste it in replacing this rock. I will go down. Then he descended, a smile on his lips, and murmuring that last word of human philosophy, perhaps. But instead of this darkness, and the thick and memphitic atmosphere he had expected to find, Dantes saw a dim and bluish light, which, as well as the air, entered not merely by the aperture he had just formed, but by the interstices and crevices of the rock which were visible from without, and through which he could distinguish the blue sky and the waving branches of the evergreen oaks and the tendrils of the creepers that grew from the rocks. After having stood a few minutes in the cavern, the atmosphere of which was rather warm than damp, Dantes's eye, habituated as it was to darkness, could pierce even to the remotest angles of the cavern, which was of granite that sparkled like diamonds. Alas, said Edmond, smiling, these are the treasures the cardinal has left, and the good abbey, seeing in a dream these glittering walls, has indulged in fallacious hopes. But he called to mind the words of the will, which he knew by heart. In the farthest angle of the second opening, said the cardinal's will, he had only found the first grotto. He had now to seek the second. Dantes continued his search. He reflected that this second grotto must penetrate deeper into the island. He examined the stones and sounded one part of the wall where he fancied the opening existed, masked for precaution's sake. The pickaxe struck for a moment with a dull sound that drew out of Dantes's forehead large drops of perspiration. At last it seemed to him that one part of the wall gave forth a more hollow and deeper echo. He eagerly advanced and with the quickness of perception that no one but a prisoner possesses, saw that there, in all probability, the opening must be. However, he, like Caesar Borgia, knew the value of time, and, in order to avoid fruitless toil, he sounded all the other walls with his pickaxe, struck the earth with the butt of his gun, and, finding nothing that appeared suspicious, returned to that part of the wall whence issued the consoling sound he had before heard. He again struck it, and with greater force, then a singular thing occurred. As he struck the wall, pieces of stucco similar to that used in the groundwork of arabesques broke off and fell to the ground in flakes, exposing a large white stone. The aperture of the rock had been closed with stones, then this stucco had been applied and painted to imitate granite. Dantes struck with the sharp end of his pickaxe, which entered somewhere between the interstices. It was there he must dig. But by some strange play of emotion, in proportion as the proofs that Faria had not been deceived became stronger, so did his heart give way, and a feeling of discouragement stole over him. This last proof, instead of giving him fresh strength, deprived him of it. The pickaxe descended, or rather fell. He placed it on the ground, passed his hand over his brow, and remounted the stairs, alleging to himself, as an excuse, a desire to be assured that no one was watching him, but in reality because he felt that he was about to faint. The island was deserted, and the sun seemed to cover it with its fiery glance. Afar off, a few small fishing boats studded the bosom of the blue ocean. Dantes had tasted nothing, but he thought not of hunger at such a moment. He hastily swallowed a few drops of rum, and again entered the cavern. The pickaxe that had seemed so heavy was now like a feather in his grasp. He seized it and attacked the wall. After several blows, he perceived that the stones were not cemented, but had been merely placed one upon the other and covered with stucco. 
He inserted the point of his pickaxe, and using the handle as a lever, with joy saw the stone turn as if on hinges, and fall at his feet. He had nothing more to do now, but with the iron tooth of the pickaxe to draw the stones towards him one by one. The aperture was already sufficiently large for him to enter, but by waiting he could still cling to the hope, and retard the certainty of deception. At last, after renewed hesitation, Dantes entered the second grotto. The second grotto was lower and more gloomy than the first. The air that could only enter by the newly formed opening had that memphitic spell Dantes was surprised not to find in the outer cabin. He waited in order to allow pure air to displace the foul atmosphere, and then went on. At the left of the opening was a dark and deep angle, but to Dantes's eye there was no darkness. He glanced around this second grotto. It was, like the first, empty. The treasure, if it existed, was buried in this corner. The time had at last arrived, two feet of earth removed, and Dantes's fate would be decided. He advanced towards the angle, and summoning all his resolution, attacked the ground with the pickaxe. At the fifth or sixth blow, the pickaxe struck against an iron substance. Never did funeral knell, never did alarm bell, produce a greater effect on the hearer. Had Dantes found nothing, he could not have become more ghastly pale. He again struck his pickaxe into the earth, and encountered the same resistance but not with the same sound. It is a casket of wood bound with iron, thought he. At this moment a shadow passed rapidly before the opening. Dantes seized his gun, sprang through the opening, and mounted the stair. A wild goat had passed before the mouth of the cave, and was feeding at a little distance. This would have been a favorable occasion to secure his dinner, but Dantes feared lest the report of his gun should attract attention. He thought a moment, cut a branch of a resinous tree, lighted it at the fire at which the smugglers had prepared their breakfast, and descended with his torch. He wished to see everything. He approached the hole he had dug, and now, with the aid of the torch, saw that his pickaxe had in reality struck against iron and wood. He planted his torch in the ground and resumed his labor. In an instant, a space three feet long by two feet broad was cleared, and Dantes could see an oaken coffer, bound with cut steel. In the middle of the lid he saw engraved on a silver plate, which was still untarnished, the arms of the Spada family, that is, a sword, pale on an oval shield, like all the Italian armorial bearings, and surmounted by a cardinal's hat. Dantes easily recognized them, for he had so often drawn them for him. There was no longer any doubt, the treasure was there, no one would have been at such pains to conceal an empty casket. In an instant he had cleared every obstacle away, and he saw successively the lock placed between two padlocks, and the two handles at each end all carved as things were carved at that epoch, when art rendered the commonest metals precious. Dantes seized the handles and strove to lift the coffer. It was impossible. He sought to open it. Lock and padlock were fastened. These faithful guardians seemed unwilling to surrender their trust. Dantes inserted the sharp end of the pickaxe between the coffer and the lid, and pressing with all his force on the handle, burst open the fastenings. The hinges yielded in their turn and fell, still holding in their grasp fragments of the wood, and the chest was open. Edmond was seized with vertigo. He cocked his gun and laid it beside him. He then closed his eyes as children do in order that they may see in the resplendent night of their own imagination more stars than are visible in the firmament. He then reopened them and stood motionless with amazement. Three compartments divided the coffer. In the first blazed piles of golden coin. In the second were ranged bars of unpolished gold which possessed nothing attractive save their value. In the third, Edmond grasped handfuls of diamonds, pearls, and rubies, which, as they fell on one another, sounded like hail against glass. After having touched, felt, examined these treasures, Edmond rushed through the caverns like a man seized with frenzy. He leaped upon a rock from whence he could behold the sea. He was alone, alone with these countless, these unheard-of treasures. Was he awake, or was it but a dream? He would fain have gazed upon his gold, and yet he had not strength enough. For an instant he leaned his head in his hands, as if to prevent his senses from leaving him, and then rushed madly about the rocks of Monte Cristo, terrifying the wild goats and scaring the sea fowls with his wild cries and gestures. Then he returned, and still unable to believe the evidence of his senses, rushed into the grotto and found himself before this mine of gold and jewels. This time he fell on his knees, and clasping his hands convulsively, uttered a prayer intelligible to God alone. 
he soon became calmer and more happy, for only now did he begin to realize his felicity. He then set himself to work to count his fortune. There were a thousand ingots of gold, each weighing from two to three pounds. Then he piled up twenty-five thousand crowns, each worth about eighty francs of our money, and bearing the effigies of Alexander the Sixth and his predecessors, and he saw that the complement was not half empty. And he measured ten double handfuls of pearls, diamonds, and other gems, many of which, mounted by the most famous workmen, were valuable beyond their intrinsic worth. Dantes saw the light gradually disappear, and fearing to be surprised in the cavern, left it, his gun in his hand. A piece of biscuit and a small quantity of rum formed his supper, and he snatched a few hours' sleep, lying over the mouth of the cave. It was a night of joy and terror such as this man of stupendous emotions had already experienced twice or thrice in his lifetime. End of chapter 24 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão, de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo, by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 25. The Unknown. Day, for which Dantes had so eagerly and impatiently waited with open eyes, again dawned. With the first light, Dantes resumed his search. Again he climbed the rocky aid he had ascended the previous evening and strained his view to catch every peculiarity of the landscape. But it wore the same wild, barren aspect when seen by the rays of the morning sun, which it had done when surveyed by the fading glimmer of eve. Descending into the grotto, he lifted the stone, filled his pockets with gems, put the box together as well, and securely as he could, sprinkled fresh sand over the spot from which it had been taken, and then carefully trod down the earth to give it everywhere a uniform appearance. Then, quitting the grotto, he replaced the stone, heaping on it broken masses of rock and rough fragments of crumbling granite, filling the interstices with earth, into which he deftly inserted rapidly growing plants, such as the wild myrtle and flowering thorn. Then, carefully watering these new plantations, he scrupulously effaced every trace of footsteps leaving the approach to the cavern as savage-looking and untrodden as he had found it. This done, he impatiently awaited the return of his companions, to wait at Monte Cristo for the purpose of watching like a dragon over the almost incalculable riches that had thus fallen into his possession, satisfied not the cravings of his heart, which yearned to return to dwell among mankind, and to assume the rank, power, and influence which are always according to wealth that first and greatest of all the forces within the grasp of men. On the sixth day the smugglers returned. From a distance Dantes recognized the rag and handling of the young Amelia, and dragging himself with affected difficulty toward the landing place, he met his companions with an assurance that, although considerably better than when they quitted him, he still suffered acutely from his late accident. He then inquired how they had fared in their trip. To this question, the smugglers replied that, although successful in landing their cargo in safety, they had scarcely done so when they received intelligence that the guard ship had just quitted the port of Toulon and was crowding all sails toward them. This obliged them to make all the speed they could to evade the enemy, when they could but lament the absence of Dantes, whose superior skill in the management of the vessel would have availed them so materially. In fact, the pursuing vessel had almost overtaken them when, fortunately, night came on, and enabled them to double the Cape of Corsica, and so elude all further pursuit. Upon the whole, however, the trip had been sufficiently successful to satisfy all concerned, while the crew, and particularly Jacopo, expressed great regrets that Dantes had not been an equal sharer with themselves in the profits, which amounted to no less a sum than fifty piastres each. Edmund preserved the most admirable self-command, not suffering the faintest indication of a smile to escape him at the enumeration of all the benefits he would have reaped had he been able to quit the island. But, as the young Amelia had nearly come to Monte Cristo to fetch him away, he embarked that same evening and proceeded with the captain to Leghorn. 
Arrived at Leghorn, he repaired to the house of a Jew, a dealer in precious stones, to whom he disposed of four of his smallest diamonds for five thousand francs each. Dantes half feared that such valuable jewels in hands of a poor sailor like himself might excite suspicions. But the cunning processor asked no troublesome questions concerning a bargain, by which he gained a round profit of at least eighty per cent. The following day, Dantes presented Jacopo with an entirely new vessel, accompanying the gift by a donation of one hundred piastres, that he might provide himself with a suitable crew and other requisites for his outfit, upon condition that he would go at once to Marseilles for the purpose of acquiring after an old man named Luis Dantes, residing in the alleys de Melian, and also a young woman called Mercedes, an inhabitant of the Catalan village. Jacopo could scarcely believe his senses at receiving this magnificent present, which Dantes hastened to account for by saying that he had merely been a sailor from him with an desire to spite his family, who did not allow him as much money as he liked to spend, but that on his arrival at Leghorn he had come into possession of a large fortune, left him by an uncle, whose sole heir he was. The superior education of Dantes gave an air of such extreme probability to this statement that it never at once occurred to Jacopo to doubt its accuracy. The terms for which Edmund had engaged to serve on board, the young Amelia, having expired, Dantes took leave of the captain, who at first tried all his powers of persuasion to induce him to remain as one of the crew, but having been told the history of the legacy, he ceased to importune him further. The following morning, Jacopo set sail for Marseilles, with direction from Dantes to join him at the island of Mount Christ. Having seen Jacopo fairly out of the harbour, Dantes proceeded to make his final adieu on board the young Amelia, distributing so liberal a gratuity among her crew as to secure him the good wishes of all and expressions of cordial interest in all that concerned him. To the captain he promised to write when he had made up his mind as to his future plans. Then Dantes departed for Genoa. At the moment of his arrival, a small yacht was under trial in the bay. This yacht had been built by order of an Englishman, who, having heard that Genoese excelled all other builders along the shores of the Mediterranean in the construction of fast-sailing vessels, was desirous of possessing a specimen of their skill. The price agreed upon between the Englishman and the Genoese builder was 40,000 francs. Dantes, struck with the beauty and capability of the little vessel, applied to its owner to transfer it to him, offering 60,000 pounds upon condition that he should be allowed to take immediate possession. The proposal was too advantageous to be refused, the more so as the person for whom the edge was intended had gone upon a tour through Switzerland, and was not expected back in less than three weeks or a month, by which time the builder reckoned upon being able to complete another. A bargain was therefore struck. Dantes led the owner to the yacht to the dwelling of a Jew, retired with later from a few minutes to a small back parlour, and upon their return the Jew counted out the shipholder the sum of sixty thousand francs in bright gold pieces. The delighted builder then offered their services in providing a suitable crew for the little vessel, but this Dantes declined with many thanks, saying he was accustomed to cruise about quite alone, and his principal pleasure consisted in managing his yacht himself. And the only thing the builder could oblige him in would be to contrive a sort of secret closet in the cabin at his bed's head, the closet to contain three divisions, so constructed as to be concealed from all but himself. The builder cheerfully undertook the commission, and promised to have this secret place completed by the next day. Then this, furnishing the dimensions of, and plan in the corners with which they were to be constructed. The following day Dantes sailed with his yacht from Genoa, under the inspection of an immense crowd that drawn together by curiosity to see the rich Spanish nobleman who preferred managing his own yacht. But their wonder was soon changed to admiration at seeing the perfect skill with which Dantes handled her helm. The boat, indeed, seemed to be animated 
with almost human intelligence, so promptly they did obey the slightest touch. And Dantes required but the short trial of his beautiful craft to acknowledge that the Genoese had not without reason attained her high reputation in the art of shipbuilding. Spectators followed the little vessel with their eyes as long as it remained visible. They then returned their conjectures upon her probable destination. Some insisted she was making for Corsica, others the island of Elba. Bets were offered to any amount that she was bound for Spain, while Africa was possibility reported by many persons as her intended course, but no one thought of Monte Cristo. Yet, thither it was that Dantes guided his vessel, and that Monte Cristo here arrived at the close of the second day. His boat had proved herself a first-class sailor, and it had come the distance from Genoa in thirty-five hours. Dantes had carefully noted the general appearance of the shore, and, instead of landing at the usual place, he dropped anchor in the little creek. The island was utterly deserted, and bore no evidence of having been visited since he went away. His treasure was just as he had left it. Early on the following morning, he commenced the removal of his riches, and here nightfall, the whole of his immense wealth was safely deposited in the compartments of the secret locker. A week passed by. Dantes employed it in maneuvering his riat round the island, studying it as a skilful horseman would the animal he destined for some important service, till at the end of that time he had perfectly conversant with its good and bad qualities. The former Dantes proposed to augment the later to remedy. Upon the eighty day, he discerned a small vessel under full sail approaching Monte Cristo. As it drew near, he recognized as the boat he had given to Jacopo, he immediately signaled it. His signal was returned, and in two hours afterwards the newcomer lay an anchor beside the yacht. A mournful answer awaited each of Edmund's eager inquiries as to the information Jacopo had obtained. All Dantes was dead, and Mercedes had disappeared. Dantes listened to these melancholy tidings with outward calmness, but, leaping lightly ashore, he signified his desire to be quite alone. In a couple of hours he returned. Two of the men from the Copa's boat came on board the yacht to assist him in navigating it, and he gave orders that she should be steered direct to Marseilles. For his father's death he was in some manner prepared, but he knew not how to account for the mysterious disappearance of Mercedes. Without divulging his secret, Dantes could not give sufficiently clear instructions to an agent. There were, besides, other particulars he was desirous of asserting, and those who were of a nature he alone could investigate in a manner satisfactory to him. His looking-glass had assured him, during his stay at Leghorn, that he ran no risk of recognition. Moreover, he had now the means of adopting any disguise he thought proper. One fine morning, then, his yacht, followed by the little fishing boat, boldly entered the port of Marseilles, and anchored exactly opposite the spot from whence, on the never-to-be-forgotten night of his departure at Chateau d'If, he had been put on board the boat destined to convey him thither. Still, Dantes could not view without a shudder the approach of a gendarme who accompanied the officer's deputy to demand his bill of health, here the edge was permitted to hold communication with shore. But with that perfect self-possession he had acquired during his acquaintance with Faria, Dantes coolly presented an English passport he had obtained from Leghorn, and, as this gave him a standing which a French passport would not have afforded, he was informed that there existed no obstacle to his immediate divertation. The first person to attract the attention of Dantes as he launched on the canabier, was one of the crew belonging to the pharaoh. Edmund welcomed the meeting with this, this fellow, who had been one of his own sailors, as a sure means of testing the extent of the change which time had worked in his own appearance. Going straight towards him, he propounded a variety of questions on different subjects, carefully watching the man's countenance as he did so. 
but not a word or look implied that he had the slightest idea of ever having seen before the portion with whom he was then conversing. Giving the sailor a piece of money in return for his civility, Dantes proceeded onwards, but here he had gone many steps, he heard the man loudly calling in to stop. Dantes instantly turned to meet him. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said the honest fellow, in almost breathless haste. "'But I believe you make a, made the mistake. You intended to give me a two-franc piece, and see, you gave me a double Napoleon.' Thank you, my good friend. I see that I have made a trifling mistake, as you say. But by way of rewarding your honesty, I give you another double Napoleon, that you may drink to my health, and be able to ask your messmates to join you. So extreme was the surprise of the sailor, that he was unable even to thank Edmund, whose receding figure he continued to gaze after in speechless astonishment. Some Nabob from India was his comment. Dentes, meanwhile, went on his way. Each step he trod the press his heart with fresh emotion. His first and most indelible recollections were there, not a tree, not a street, that he passed, but seemed filled with dear and cherished memories. And thus he proceeded onwards, till he arrived at the end of the Rue de Noyelles, from whence a full view of Alice de Melian was obtained. At this spot, so pregnant, with fond and filial remembrances, his heart beat almost so bursting, his knees tottered under him, a mist floated over his side, and had he not clung for support to one of the trees, he would inevitably have fallen to the ground and been crushed beneath the many vehicles continually passing him there. Recovering himself, however, he wiped the perspiration from his brows, and stopped not again till he found himself at the door of the house in which his father had lived. The nasturtiums and other plants, which his father had delighted to train before his window, had all disappeared from the upper part of the house. Leaning against the tree, he gazed thoughtfully for a time at the upper stories of the shabby little house. Then he advanced to the door and asked whether there were any rooms to be let. Though answered in the negative, he begged so earnestly to be permitted to visit those on the fifth floor that, in spite of the of the repeated assurance of the concierge that they were occupied, Dantes succeeded in inducing the man to go up to the tenants and ask permission for a gentleman to be allowed to look at them. The tenants of the humble lodging were a young couple who had been scarcely married a week, and seeing them, Dantes sighed heavily. Nothing in the two small chambers forming the apartments remained as it had been in the time of the elder Dantes. The very paper was different while the articles of antiquate furniture with which the room had been filled in Edmund's time had all disappeared. The four walls alone remained as he had left them. The bed belonging to the present occupants was placed as the former owner of the chamber had been accustomed to have his, and, in spite of his efforts to prevent it, the eyes of Edmund were suffused in tears as he reflected that, on that spot, the old man had breath of his last, vainly calling for his son. The young couple gazed with astonishment at sight of their visitor's emotion, and wondered to see the large tears silently chasing each other down his otherwise stern and immovable features. But they felt the sacredness of his grief, and kindly refrained from questioning him as to its cause, while, with instinctive delicacy, they left him to enjoy his sorrow alone. When he withdrew from the scene of his painful recollections, they both accompanied him downstairs, reiterating their hope that he would come again whenever he pleased, and assuring him that their poor dwelling would ever be open to him. As Edmund passed the door on, on the fourth floor, he paused to inquire whether Cadrus, the tailor, still dwelt there. But he received for reply that the person in question had got into difficulties, and that the present time kept a small inn on the route from Bellegarde to pay care. Having obtained the address of the person to whom the house in Ailes de Mayen belonged, Dante's next proceeded thither, and, under the name of Lord Wilmore, the name and title inscribed on his passport, 
purchased the small dwelling for the sum of twenty-five thousand francs, at least ten thousand more than it was worth, but had its owner asked half a million, it would unhesitantly have been given. The very same day the occupants of the apartments on the fifth floor of the house, now become the property of Dante's, were duly informed by the notary, who had arranged the necessary transfer of deeds, etc., that the new landlord gave them their choice of any of the rooms in the house, without the least argumentation of rents, upon condition of their giving instant possession of the two small chambers they at present inhabited. This strange event aroused great wonder and curiosity in the neighborhood of the Alice de Maya, and a multitude of theories were afloat, none of which was anywhere near the truth. But what raised public astonishment to a climax, and set all conjecture at defiance, was the knowledge that the same stranger who had in the morning visited the Alice de Maya had been seen in the evening walking in the little village of the Catalans, and afterwards observed to enter a poor fisherman's hut, and to pass more than an hour in inquiry after persons who have either been dead or gone away for more than fifteen or sixteen years. But on the following day, the family from whom all these particulars had been asked received a handsome present, consisting of an entirely new fishing boat, with two saints and a tender. The delighted recipients of these munificent gifts would gladly have poured out their thanks to their general's benefactor, but they had seen him, upon quitting the hut, merely give some orders to a sailor, and then, springing lightly on horseback, leave Marseilles by the port day. End of chapter 25all the box recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 26 The Pont to Guard Inn Such of my readers as have made the pedestrian excursions to the south of France may perchance have noticed, without midway between the town of Beaucaire and village of Bellegarde, a little nearer to the former than to the latter, a small roadside inn, from the front of which hung, creaking and flapping in the wind, a sheet of tin covered with a grotesque representation of the Pont du Garde. This modern place of entertainment stood on the left-hand side of the post-road, and backed upon the Rhone. It also boasted of what it Languedoc is style the garden, consisting of a small plot of ground, on the side opposite to the main entrance reserved for the reception of guests. A few thinking olives and stunted fig trees struggle hard for existence, but there with red dusty foliage abundantly prove how unequal was the conflict. Between these sticky shrubs grew a scantly supply of garlic, tomatoes and escalots, while, lone and solitary, like a forgotten sentinel, a tall pine raised its melancholy head in one of the corners of this unattractive spot, and displayed its flexible stem and fan-shaped summit, dried and cracked by the fierce heat of the subtropical sun. In the surrounding plain, which more resembled a dusky lake than solid ground, were scattered a few miserable stalks of wheat, the effect, no doubt, of a curious desire on the part of the agricultural tourists of the country to see whether such a thing as the raising of grain in those parched regions were practicable. Each stalk served as a perch for a grasshopper, which regaled the passers by through this Egyptian scene with its straight and monotonous tone. For about seven or eight years, the little tavern had been kept by a man and his wife with two servants, a chambermaid named Trinette and a hostler called Pacot. This small staff was quite equal to all the requirements, for a canal between Bucar and Egmort had revolutionized transportation by substituting boats for the cart and stagecoach. And, as though to add to the daily misery which this prosperous cattle inflicted on the unfortunate innkeeper, oh, what the ruin it was fast accomplished, it was situated between the Rhone from which it had its source and both the road it had depleted, not a hundred steps from the inn, of which we have given a brief but faithful description. 
and the innkeeper himself was a man of from forty to fifty-five years of age, tall, strong, and bony, a perfect specimen of natives at those southern latitudes. He had dark, sparkling, and deep-set eyes, hooked nose, and teeth white as those of a carnivorous animal. His hair, like his beard, which he wore under his chin, was thick and curly, and in spite of his age but slightly interspersed with a few silvery threads. His natural dark complexion had assumed a still further shade of brown from the habit the unfortunate man had acquired of stationing himself from morning till eve at the threshold of his door, on the lookout for guests who seldom came. Yet there he stood, day after day, exposed to the meridional rays of a burning sun, with no other protection for his head than a red handkerchief twisted around it, after the manner of the Spanish maltiers. This man was our old acquaintance, Gaspar Cadros. His wife, on the contrary, whose maiden name had been Madeleine Radel, was pale, meagre, and sickly-looking. Born in the neighborhood of Arles, she had shared in the beauty for which its women are proverbial, but that beauty had gradually withered beneath the devastating influence of the slow fever so prevalent among dwellers by the ponds of Egmort and the marshes of Camargue. She remained nearly always in her second-floor chamber, shivering in her chair, or stretched languid and feeble on her bed, while her husband kept his daily watch at the door. A duty he performed with so much the greater willingness as it saved him the necessity of listening to the endless plates and murmurs of his helpmate, who never saw him without breaking out into bitter invectives against fate, to all of which her husband would calmly return an unvarying reply in these philosophic words. Hush, la carcotte, it is God's pleasure that things should be so. The sobriquet of la carcotte had been bestowed on Madeleine Redel from the fact that she had been born in a village, so-called, situated between Salon and Las Banques, and, as a custom existed among the inhabitants of that part of France, where Cadros lived of styling every person by some particular and distinctive appellation, her husband had bestowed on her the name of La Carconte in place of her sweet and euphonious name of Madeleine, which, in all probability, his rude cultural language would not have enabled him to pronounce. Still, let it not be supposed that, amid his affected resignation to the will of Providence, the unfortunate innkeeper did not write under the double misery of seeing the hateful Scanel carry off his customers and his profits in the daily inflictions of his peevish partner's murmurs and lamentations. Like other dwellers in the South, he was a man of sober habits and moderate desires, but fond of external show, vain, and addicted to display. During the days of his prosperity, not a festivity took place without himself and wife being among the spectators. He dressed in the picturesque costume worn upon grand occasions by the inhabitants of the South of France, bearing equal resemblance to the style adopted both by the Catalans and Andalusians. While La Carconte displayed the charming fashion prevalent among the women of Arles, a mode of attire borrowed equally from Greece and Arabia. But, by degrees, watch chains, necklaces, party-colored scarves, embroidered bodies, velvet vests, elegantly worked stockings, striped gaiters, and silver buckles for shoes all disappeared and Gaspard Cadarus, unable to appear abroad in his pristine splendor, had given up any further participation in the pomps and vanities, both from him and his wife, although a bitter feeling of envious discontent filled his mind as sound of mirth and merry music from the joyous revelers reached even the miserable hostelry to which he still clung, more for the shelter than profit it afforded. Cadarus then was, as usual, at his place of observation before the door, his eyes glancing listlessly from a piece of closely shaven glass, on which some folds were industriously, though fruitlessly, endeavoring to turn up some grain or insect suited to their palate. To the deserted road, which led away to the north and south, when he was aroused by the shrill voice of his wife, and grumbling to himself as he went, he mounted to her chamber first taking care, however, to set the entrance door wide open, as an invitation to any chance traveller who might be passing. 
At the moment Cadderbus quitted this sentry-like watch before the door, the road on which he so eagerly strained his sight was void and lonely as a desert at midday. There it lay stretching out into one interminable line of dust and sand, with its sides bordered by tall, meager trees, altogether presenting so uninviting an appearance that no one in his senses could have imagined that any traveller, at liberty to regulate his hours for journeying, would choose to expose himself in such a formidable Sahara. Nevertheless, had Cadarus but retained his post a few minutes longer, he might have caught the dim outline of something approaching from the direction of Bellegarde. As the moving object drew nearer, he would easily have perceived that it consisted of a man and a horse, between whom the kindest and most amiable understanding appeared to exist. The horse was of Hungarian breed, and ambled along at an easy pace. His rider was a priest, dressed in black and wearing a three-cornered hat, and, spite of the ardent rays of a noonday sun, the pair came on a fair degree of rapidity. Having arrived before the pond to guard, the horse stopped, but whether for his own pleasure or that of his rider would have been difficult to say. However that might have been, the priest dismounting led his stood by the bridle in search of some place to which he could secure him. Availing himself of a handle that projected from a half-fallen door, he tied the animal safely and, having drawn a red cotton handkerchief from his pocket, wiped away the perspiration that streamed from his brow. Then, advancing to the door, struck thrice with the end of his iron-shod stick. At this unusual sound, a huge black dog came rushing to meet the daring assailants of his ordinary tranquil abode, snarling and displaying his sharp white teeth with a determined hostility that abundantly proved how little he was accustomed to society. At that moment, a heavy footstep was heard descending the wooden staircase that led from the upper floor and, with many bows and courteous smiles, my host of the Pontucard besought his guests to enter. You are welcome, sir, most welcome, repeated the astonished Caderwos. Now then, Margotin, cried he, speaking to the dog, will you be quiet? Pray, don't hit him, sir. He only barks, he never bites. I make no doubt a glass of good wine would be acceptable this dreadful hot day. Then, perceiving for the first time the garb of the traveller he had to entertain, Caderwos hastily exclaimed, a thousand pardons! I really did not observe whom I had the honour to receive under my poor roof. What would the Abbey please to have? What refreshment can I offer? All I have is at his service. The priest gazed on the person addressing him with a long and searching gaze. There even seemed a disposition on his part to court a similar scrutiny on the part of the innkeeper. Then, observing in the countenance of the latter, no other expression and extreme surprise at his own want of attention to an inquiry so courteously worded, he deemed it as well to terminate his dumb show, and therefore said, speaking with a strong Italian accent, You are, I presume, Monsieur Cadarus? Yes, sir, answered the host, even more surprised at the question than he had been by the silence which had preceded it. I am Gaspar Cadarus, at your service. Gaspard Cadros, rejoined the priest. Yes, Christian and surname are the same. You formerly lived, I believe, in the Ailes de Milan on the fourth floor. I did, and you followed the business of a tailor. True, I was a tailor, till the trade fell off. It is so hot at Marseilles that really I believe that the respectable inhabitants will in time go without any clothing whatever. But talking of heat, is there nothing I can offer you by way of refreshment? Yes, let me have a bottle of your best wine, and then, with your permission, we will resume our conversation from where we left off. As you please, sir, said Caderousse, who, anxious not to lose the present opportunity of finding a customer, for one of the few bottles of Gehors still remaining in his possession, hastily raised a trap door in the floor of the apartment they were in, which served both as parlor and kitchen. A 
upon issuing forth from his subterranean retreat at the expiration of five minutes, he found the abbey seated upon a wooden stool, leaning his elbow on a table, while Margotin, whose animosity seemed appeased by the unusual command of the traveller for refreshments, had crept up to him, and had established himself very comfortable between his knees, his long, skinny neck resting on his lap, while his dim eyes were fixed earnestly on the traveller's face. "'Are you quite alone?' inquired the guest, as Caderousse placed before him the bottle of wine and a glass. "'Quite, quite alone,' replied the man, "'or, at least, practically so, for my poor wife, who is the only person in the house besides myself, is laid up and with illness, and unable to render me the least assistance, poor thing.' "'You are married, then?' said the priest, with a show of interest, glancing round as he spoke at the scanty furnishings of the apartment. "'Ah, sir,' said Caderousse with a sigh, "'it is easy to perceive I am not a rich man, but in this world a man does not thrive the better for being honest.' The heavy fixed on him a searching, penetrating glance. "'Yes, honest, I can certainly say that much for myself.' continued the innkeeper, fairly sustaining the scrutiny of the abbey's gaze. I can boast with truth of being an honest man, and, continued he significantly, with a hand on his breast and shaking his head, that is more than everyone can say nowadays. So much the better for you, if what you assert be true, said the abbey, for I am firmly persuaded that, sooner or later, the good will be rewarded, and the wicked punished. Such words as those belong to your profession, answered Cadros, and you do well to repeat them, but, added he, with a bitter expression of countenance, one is free to believe them or not, as one pleases. You are wrong to speak thus, said the abbey, and perhaps I may, in my own person, be able to prove to you how completely you, you are in error. What mean you? inquired Cadrous with a look of surprise. In the first place, I must be satisfied that you are the person I am in search of. What proofs do you require? Did you, in the year 1814 or 1815, know anything of a young sailor named Dantes? Dantes? <laughs> Did I know, poor dear Edmund? Why, Edmund Dantes and myself were intimate friends exclaimed Caderousse, whose countenance flushed dark as he caught the penetrating gaze of the abbey fixed on him, while the clear, calm eye of the questioner seemed to dilate with feverish scrutiny. "'You remind me,' said the priest, "'that the young man concerning whom I asked you was said to bear the name of Edmund.' "'Set to bear the name,' repeated Caderousse, becoming excited and eager. Why, he was so called as truly I myself bore the appellation of Gaspard Caderousse. But tell me, I pray, what has become of poor Edmund? Did you know him? Is he alive and at liberty? Is he prosperous and happy? He died the more stretched, hopeless, heartbroken prisoner than felons who paid the penalty of their crimes at the galleys of Toulon. A deadly pallor followed the flush of the countenance of Caderousse, who turned away, and the priest saw him wiping the tears from his eyes with the corner of the red handkerchief twisted round his head. "'Poor fellow, poor fellow,' murmured Caderousse. "'Well, there, sir, is another proof that good people are never rewarded on this earth, and that none but the wicked prosper.' "'Ah,' continued Caderousse, speaking in the highly colored language of the house, the world grows worse and worse. Why does not God, if he really hates the wicked, as he is said to do, stand down brimstone and fire and consume them altogether? You speak as though you have loved this young Dantes, observed the abbey, without checking any voice of his companion's vehemence. And so I did, replied Caderousse, though once I confess I envied him his good fortune. But I swear to you, sir, I swear to you by everything a man holds dear, I have, since then, deeply and sincerely lamented his unhappy fate. 
There was a brief silence, during which a fixed, searching eye of the abbey was employed in scrutinizing the agitated features of the innkeeper. "'You knew the poor lad, then?' continued Caderousse. "'I was called to see him on his dying bed, that I might administer to him the consolations of religion.' "'And of what did he die?' asked Caderousse in a choking voice. Of what, think you, do young and strong men die in prison, when they have scarcely numbered their thirtieth year, unless it be of imprisonment? Caro swept away the large beds of perspiration that gathered on his brow. But the strangest part of the story is, resumed the abbey, that Dante's, even in his dying moments, swore by his crucified Redeemer that he was utterly ignorant of the cause of his attention. And so he was, murmured Caderousse. How should he have been otherwise? Ah, sir, the poor fellow told you the truth. And for that reason, he besought me to try and clear up a mystery he had never been able to penetrate, and to clear his memory should any false spot or stain have fallen on it. And here the look of the abbey, becoming more and more fixed, seemed to rest with ill-concealed satisfaction on the gloomy depression which was rapidly spreading over the countenance of Caderus. A rich Englishman, continued the abbey, who had been his companion in misfortune, but had been released from prison during the second restoration, was possessed of a diamond of immense value. This jewel he bestowed on Dantes upon himself quit in the prison, as a mark of his gratitude for the kindness and brotherly care with which Dantes had nursed him in a severe illness he underwent during his confinement. Instead of employing his diamond in attempting to bribe his jailers, who might only have taken it and then betrayed him to the governor, Dantes carefully preserved it. Then, in the event of his getting out of prison, he might have wed with all to life, for the sale of such a diamond would have quite sufficed to make his fortune. Then I suppose asked Caderousse with eager, glowing looks, that it was a stone of immense value? Why, everything is relative, answered the abbey. To one in Edmund's position, the diamond certainly was of great value. It was estimated at fifty thousand francs. Bless me, exclaimed Caderousse, fifty thousand francs! Surely the diamond was as large as a nut to be worth all that. No, replied the abbey. It was not of such a size as that. But you shall judge for yourself. I have it with me. The sharp gaze of the cadarose was instantly directed towards the priest's garments, as though hoping to discover the location of the treasure. Calmly drawing forth from his pocket a small box, covered with black shredgen, the abbey opened it, and displayed to the dazzled eyes of Caderousse the sparkling jewel it contained, set in a ring of admirable workmanship. And that diamond, cried Caderousse, almost restless with eager admiration, you say, is worth fifty thousand francs? It is, without setting, which is also valuable, replied the abbe, as he closed the box and returned it to his pocket, while its brilliant use seemed still to dance before the eyes of the fascinated innkeeper. But how comes the diamond is in your possession, sir? Did Edmund make you his heir? No, merely his testamentary executor. I once possessed it four dear and faithful friends, besides the maiden to whom I was betrothed, he said, and I feel convinced they have all unfittingly grieved over my loss. The name of one of the four friends is Caderousse. The innkeeper shrieks. Another of the number, continued the abbey, without seeming to notice the emotion of Caderousse, is called Danglars, and the third, in spite of being my rival, entertained a very sincere affection for me. A fiendish smile played over the features of Caderousse, who was about to break in upon the abbey's speech, when the latter, waving his hand, said, Allow me to finish first, and then if you have any observations to make, you can do so afterwards. The third of my friends, although my rival, was much attached to me. His name was Fernand. That of my betrothed was... Stay, stay, 
continued the Abbey. I have forgotten what he called her. Mercedes, said Cadros eagerly. True, said the Abbey, with a stiff-lit sigh. Mercedes it was. Go on, urged Cadros. Bring me a carafe of water, said the Abbey. Cadros quickly performed the stranger's bidding, and, after pouring some into a glass and slowly swallowing with its content, the Abbey, resuming his usual placidity of manner, said, as he placed his empty glass on the table, Where did we leave off? The name of Edmund's betrothed was Mercedes. To be sure, you will go to Marseilles, said Dantes, for you understand, I repeat this word just as he uttered them. Do you understand? Perfectly. You will sell this diamond. You will divide the money into five equal parts and give an equal portion of these good friends, the only persons who have loved me upon earth. But why into five parts? asked Cadarus. You only mentioned four persons. Because the fifth is dead, as I hear. The fifth sharer in Edmund's back was, was his own father. Too true, too true, ejaculated Cadarus, almost suffocated by the contending passions which assailed him. The poor old man did die. I learned so much at Marseilles, replied the Abbey, making a strong effort to appear indifferent. But from the length of time that has elapsed since the death of the elder Dantes, I was unable to obtain any particulars of his end. Can you enlighten me on that point? I do not know who could if I could not. Why, I lived almost on the same floor with the poor old man. Ah, yes, about a year after the disappearance of his son, the poor old man died. Of what did he die? Why, the doctors call his complaint gastroenteritis, I believe. His acquaintances said he died of grief, but I, who saw him in his dying moments, I say he died of... Of what? asked the priest anxiously and eagerly. Why, of downright starvation. Starvation? exclaimed the Abbey, springing from his seat. Why, the village animals are not suffered to die by such a death as that. The very dogs that wander houseless and homeless in the streets find some beating hand to cast them a mouthful of bread, and that a man, a Christian, should be allowed to perish of hunger in the midst of other men who call themselves Christians is too horrible for belief. Oh, it is impossible, utterly impossible. What I have said, I have said, answered Cadrus. And, and you are a fool for having said anything about it, said the voice from the top of the stairs. Why should you meddle with what does not concern you? The two men turned quickly and saw the the sickly countenance of La Carconte peering between the baluster rails. Attracted by the sound of voices, she had feebly dragged herself down the stairs, and, seated on the lower step, head on knees, she had listened to the foregoing conversation. Mind your own business, wife, replied Catherus sharply. This gentleman asks me for information, which common politeness will not permit me to refuse. Politeness, you simpleton, retorted La Carconte. What have you to do with politeness, I should like to know? Better study a little common prudence. How do you know the motives that person may have for trying to extract all he can from you? I pledge you my word, madam, said the Abbey, that my intentions are good, and that your husband can incur no risk, provided he answers me candidly. Ah, that's all very fine, retorted the woman. Nothing is easier than to begin with fair promises and assurances of nothing to fear, but when poor, silly folks, like my husband there, have been persuaded to tell all they know, the promises and assurances of safety are quickly forgotten, and at some moment, when nobody expecting it, behold trouble and misery, and all sorts of persecutions are heaped on for unfortunate wretches who cannot even see whence all their afflictions come. Nay, nay, my good woman, make yourself perfectly easy, I beg of you. 
Whatever evils may befall you, they will not be occasioned by my instrumentality. That I solemnly promise you. Lacarconte muttered a few inarticulate words. Then let her head again drop upon her knees, and went into a fit of egg, leaving the two speakers to resume the conversation, but remaining so as to be able to hear every word they uttered. Again the Abbey had been obliged to swallow a draught of water to calm the emotions that threatened to overpower him. When he had sufficiently recovered himself, he said, It appears then that the miserable old man you were telling me of was forsaken by everyone. Surely, had not such been the case, he would not have perished by so dreadful a death. Why, he was not altogether forsaken, continued Caderousse, for Mercedes, the Catalan, and Monsieur Morel were very kind to him, but somehow the poor old man had contracted a profound hatred for Fernand, the very person, added Caderousse with a bitter smile, that you named just now as being one of Dante's faithful and attached friends. And was he not so? asked the abbey. Gaspard, Gaspard, murmured the woman from her seat on the stairs. Mind what you are saying. Caderousse made no reply to these words, though evidently irritated and annoyed by the interruption, but addressing the abbey said, can a man be faithful to another whose wife he covets and desires for himself? But Dantes was so honorable and true in his own nature that he believed everybody's professions of friendship. Poor Edmund, he was cruelly deceived, but it was fortunate that he never knew, or he might have found it more difficult, when on his deathbed to pardon his enemies. And whatever people may say, continued Caderousse in his native language, which was not altogether devoid of rude poetry. I cannot help being more frightened of the idea of the malediction of the dead than the hatred of the living. Imbecile! exclaimed La Carconte. Do you then know in what manner Fernand injured Dantes? inquired the abbey of Caderousse. Do I? No one better. Speak out, then, say what it was. Gaspard, cried La Carconte, do as you will, you are master, but if you take my advice, you'll hold your tongue. Well, wife, replied Caderousse, I don't know but what you're right. So you will say nothing? asked the abbey. Why... What good would it do, asked Caderousse, if the poor lad were living, and came to me and begged that I would candidly tell which were his true and which his false enemies, why, perhaps, I should not hesitate. But you tell me he is no more, and therefore can have nothing to do with hatred or revenge, so let all such feelings be buried with him. You prefer, then, said the abbey, that I should bestow on men you say are false and treacherous, the reward intended for faithful friendship? That is true enough, returned Caderousse. You say truly, the gift of poor Edmund was not meant for such traitors as Fernand and Danglars. Besides, what would it be to them, no more than a drop of water in the ocean? Remember, chimed in Alacarconte, those two could crush you in a single blow. How so? inquired the abbey. Are these persons, then, so rich and powerful? Do you not know their history? I do not. Pray relate it to me. Caderousse seemed to reflect for a few moments, then said, No, truly, it would take up too much time. Well, my good friend, returned the abbey, in a tone that indicated utter indifference on his part. You are at liberty either to speak or be solid, just as you please. For my own part, I respect your scruples and admire your sentiments, so let matter end. I shall do my duty as consciously as I can, and fulfill my promise to the dying man. My first business will be to dispose of this diamond. So saying, the abbey again drew a small box from his pocket, 
opened it, and contrived to hold it in such a light that the bright flash of brilliance used passed before the dazzled gaze of Cadarus. "'Wife! Wife!' cried he in a hoarse voice. "'Come here!' "'Diamond!' exclaimed La Carcon, rising and descending to the chamber with a tolerably firm step. "'What diamond are you talking about?' Why, did you not hear all we said? inquired Caderousse. It is a beautiful diamond left by poor Edmond Dantes, to be sold, and money divided between his father, Mercedes, his betrothed bride, Fernand, Danglars, and myself. The jewels is worth at least fifty thousand francs. Oh, what a magnificent jewel! cried the astonished woman. The fifth part of the profits from this stone belongs to us, then, does it not? asked Caderousse. It does, replied the abbey, with the addition of an equal division of that part intended for the elder Dantes, which I believe myself a liberty to divide equally with the four survivors. And why among us four? inquired Caderousse, as being the friends Edmond esteemed most faithful and devoted to him. I don't call those friends who betray and ruin you, muttered the wife in her turn, in a low, muttering voice. Of course not, rejoined Caderous quickly. No more do I, and that was what I was observing to this gentleman just now. I said I looked upon it as a sacrilegious profanation to reward treachery, perhaps crime. Remember answered the abbey calmly, as he replaced the jewel in its case in the pocket of his cassock. It is your fault, not mine, that I do so. You will have the goodness to furnish me with the address of both Fernand and Danglars, in order that I may execute Edmund's last wishes. The agitation of Caderousse became extreme, and large drops of perspiration rolled from his hated brow. As he saw the abbey rise from his seat and go towards the door, as though to ascertain if his horse was sufficiently refreshed to continue his journey, Cadros and his wife exchanged looks of deep meaning. There, you see, wife, said the former, this splendid diamond might be all yours if we choose. Do you believe it? Why, surely a man of his holy profession would not deceive us. Well, replied La Carconte, do as you like. For my part, I wash my hands off the affair. So saying, she once more climbed the staircase leading to her chamber, her body convulsed with chills, and her teeth rattling in her head, in spite of the intense heat of the weather. Arrived at the top stairs, she turned round and called out, in a warning tone, to her husband. Gaspard, consider well what you are about to do. I have both reflected and decided answered he. La Carconte entered her chamber, the flooring of which creaked beneath her heavy and certain tread, as she proceeded towards her armchair, into which she fell as though exhausted. Well? asked the abbey as he returned to the apartment below. What have you made up your mind to do? To tell you all I know, was the reply. I certainly think you act wisely in so doing said the priest. Not because I have the least desire to learn anything you may please to conceal from me, but simply that if, through your assistance, I could distribute legacy according to the wishes of the testator, why, so much the better, that is all. I hope it may be so, replied Caderous, his face flushed with cupidity. I am all attention, said the abbey. Stop a minute answered Caderousse. We might be interrupted in the most interesting part of my story. Which would be a pity, and it is as well that your visit thither should be made known only to ourselves. With these words he went stealthy to the door, which he closed, and, by way of still greater precaution, bolted and buried it, as he was accustomed to do at night. During this time the abbey had chosen his place for listening at his ease. He removed his seat into a corner of the room, where he himself would be in deep shadow, while the light would be fully thrown on the narrator. Then, with head bent down and hands clasped, or rather clinched together, he
he prepared to give his whole attention to Gatherus, who seated himself on the little stool exactly opposite to him. Remember, this is no affair of mine, said the trembling voice of Lacarcon, as though through the flooring of her chamber she viewed the scene that was enacting below. Enough, enough, replied Caderousse. Say no more about it. I will take all the consequences upon myself. And he began his story. End of chapter 26